questions. Questions are had. The Honourable Member from Thornhill. These farmers, First Nations from across Canada are struggling because of this Prime Minister's ideological carbon tax crusade. Food bank usage is up 100%, and today we learned that the average grocery bill will go up by $700 wow. next year. His senators are blocking relief for Canadians struggling to eat. First Nations communities are taking him to court because of this carbon tax. Conservatives have proposed a motion to axe the tax and will stay here as long as as it takes. So will the Liberals finally listen to Canadians and vote with us to, to scrap the punishing carbon tax? The Honourable Minister for Natural Resources. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A price on pollution is an important part of a climate plan, one that addresses affordability concerns. The vast majority of Canadians receive more money in the rebate than they pay in the price of pollution. The only group to benefit from the Conservative plan to end the, the, the climate program, to end the rebate, are the top 20% of earners who almost everyone else gets poorer for their plan. The Conservatives are fighting for the rich. They are not fighting for Canadians who are concerned about affordability. The carbon price is both a climate measure and an affordability measure. Yeah, yeah. The Honourable Member from Thornhill. Some talking points, but I'll take that as a no. Not only are they not go going to vote against our motion, but they're going to also quadruple the carbon tax on gas, groceries and home heating. Instead of voting to take the tax off of farmers, this desperate Prime Minister spent his weekend calling Liberal senators to manipulate a vote that he already lost in this House. Senators gutted the bill, betraying farmers, and then his caucus lost their minds over a plan to make them work overtime unless they axe the carbon tax. So why won't they keep their hands out of everyone else's pockets and finally axe the tax so Canadians can put food on the table? The Honourable Government House Leader. Speaker, there's only one caucus in this parliament that's losing their mind, and it's the Conservatives, <laughs> so because their true. Conservative senators didn't show up to vote on Bill C-234 yeah, in the other place. True. Mr. Wow. Speaker, we are happy to be here as long as it takes, because we will always stand up for Canadians, exactly. and we will always stand against Hello. bullies. Thank we you, We will. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Thornhill. Mr. Speaker, that's the exact opposite of what she said yesterday. Because of ministers like this, more Canadians will eat in food banks than ever, and more simply will go without any food at all. And for the new year, everyone is going to spend $700 more on groceries. While these Liberals fight for a few extra days of Christmas vacation, we're going to fight for Canadians, and then we'll send the Prime Minister on the permanent vacation that Canadians desperately want him to take. Why won't they ax the tax? for families, for farmers, for First Nations, for good. The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources and Energy. Mr. Speaker, 98% of farm fuel emissions are already unimpacted by the price on pollution. Farmers, though, are on the front lines of climate change. They understand the critical importance of addressing the climate issue. There are many factors that are contributing to the rise of food prices in Canada and around the world, including the war in Ukraine. While the Conservatives continue to vote against Ukraine and oppose the free trade agreement they need in their fight against Russia, we are taking action to reduce and ensure affordability for Canadians and support the government of Ukraine. The Honourable Member for Mégantique Nérable. After eight years of this Prime Minister, grocery prices continue to skyrocket. The report on food prices in Canada predicts that a typical family will see its bill rise by $700 in 2024. The price of meat, fresh vegetables and bakery products will rise by almost 7 per cent next year. And the costly Liberal Bloc coalition continues to drastically increase inflationary taxes that drive up the price of everything. It costs a lot to vote block. Will the Prime Minister cancel his plan to drastically increase the carbon tax on farmers and families so that people can eat? The Honourable Minister for Families. Thank you for the question. Every day that I come in this House and I take my seat, I'm humbled, as I know all of my colleagues on this side of the House are, to work on behalf of Canadians. Mr. Speaker, when we talk about the need to support Canadians, just yesterday, every Conservative on that side of the House voted against a national school food policy, a policy that would put food back into children so they're not at school hungry, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we will continue to do everything to support Canadian families. Bravo. The Honourable Member for Mégantique-Lérable. 
Well, you know what's true? After eight years of this Liberal government, children are asking for gift cards to be able to eat at Christmas, Mr. Speaker. It's unacceptable. After eight years of this Prime Minister, the cost of housing has doubled, interest rates are at record highs, grocery prices have risen 23 percent, and these prices will continue to rise next year for groceries. Mr. Speaker, will the Liberals do the right thing for once? and vote to cancel the carbon tax so that grocery prices can go down and so that people can eat until they feel full this Christmas. The Honourable Finance Minister and Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, all Canadians and all Quebecers know that the Conservatives do not support the less well-off. Our government supports all Canadians. Our government supports the least well-off. This month, UNICEF published data according to which poverty levels in Canada decreased 22 percent. The Conservatives only know how to slash, 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 cut, cut, cut. But we're here for all Canadians, especially those who need help the most. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. Quebecers take in 48 percent of all asylum seekers in Canada, and that costs us $460 million. Quebecers deserve to be reimbursed, not to be insulted, and yet not only is the Minister of Immigration refusing to reimburse Quebec, but on Tuesday he repeated in committee that he's thinking of imposing an additional bill on Quebec. Imagine that. We offer 100 percent of the services, we pay 100 percent of the bill, and he thinks that Quebecers owe him more money? I couldn't make this up if I tried. Mr. Speaker, the minister will meet with his Quebec counterpart tomorrow. Will he leave his arrogance at home and bring his checkbook instead? The Honourable Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Minister. What's arrogant, Mr. Speaker, is to think that a relationship is a one-way relationship. We work very well with Quebec. I look forward to my meeting with my counterpart tomorrow. We're not going to be able to solve this problem with our marathon voting in the House of Commons. Either way, I will meet with my Quebec counterpart. We will have a great discussion, and then we will have a discussion with our respective finance ministers. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. Sure, let's talk about collaboration then. What is the federal government doing for asylum seekers? Asylum seekers are under federal jurisdiction, but the federal government provides 0% of social services and pays 0% of the bill. And the icing on the cake is that Ottawa's delays in issuing work permits and in reviewing applications adds to the bill that Quebecers pay. So, in short, Quebecers pay for 100 percent of services, provide 100 percent of services, pay the whole bill, and they're paying too much, thanks to the federal government, which is asleep at the switch. So we don't need to take any lessons. Tomorrow, will the minister reimburse Quebecers? The Honourable Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Minister. Mr. Speaker, the Bloc Québécois feels that $700 million a year and a lot more in social and health transfers doesn't count for anything. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Seven million Canadians uh, are expected, uh, are struggling now because they have to use food banks. The price of food is going to go up by $700 next year just to put food on the table. In committee this morning, Walmart CEO said he's not supporting a stronger competition bureau. Maybe that's why the leader of the opposition did everything he could to block the legislation. Galen Wesson, as we all know, earns 431 times what his average employee makes he, and thinks his $12 million bonus was reasonable. What is the prime minister going to do to bring down grocery prices and end the free ride for these CEOs? <laughs> The Honourable Minister. Merci. Merci, Monsieur. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. C-56 will help us further strengthen the Competition Bureau and to prioritize the interests of consumers. I hope that our colleagues will support us on this bill because it's an important one. It will help us to harmonize prices and to bring about uh, lower prices. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Seven million de Canadiens. Seven million Canadians, including more and more workers, are visiting food banks because they cannot pay for groceries. Today, we have learned that groceries will rise by $700 in 2024. Gail Weston, though, he said in committee, that his $12 million bonus was very reasonable. What will the Prime Minister do to bring down prices 
and make these CEOs contribute. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we are keeping an eye on the measures taken by grocery prices, including harmonizing prices, price freezes, and uh, sales. We are also looking into long-term measures to bring down grocery costs. C-56 will allow the Competition Bureau to hold big grocers to account and to ensure that they prioritize the best interests of consumers. And we will follow up with CEOs. Eight years, Canadians are learning the hard way that the Prime Minister is simply not worth the cost. And the latest food price report shows that Canadians are bracing for another devastating blow next year with families being forced to pay over $700 more for groceries. And that's on top of all the price increases the Prime Minister's carbon tax and inflationary deficits have already cost. In, uh, caused. Instead of making food more expensive with planned tax hikes, why, doesn't the Liberals, why don't the Liberals support our common sense plan to take the carbon tax off of families, First Nations and farmers? for Canadian families, saving them hundreds of dollars each and every month. Mr. Speaker, we'll continue to work hard on behalf of Canadian families. The Honourable Member from Regina Capel. The transformation that this government has caused to families is that working people now have to go to food banks after eight years of this Prime Minister. Let me read you a quote from that food price report. Canadians are reducing their expenditures on groceries, either by reducing the quantity or quality of food they are buying. This is unbelievable. This is in Canada. We used to have a high quality of life, especially for working people. And now those people with jobs are having to put water in their milk or literally go hungry. Do the Liberals not realize what they've done to this country? And when will they finally take the tax off so food prices can come down? The Honourable Minister of Finance and Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we will take no lessons from the Conservatives when it comes to supporting the least vulnerable in Canada. Let's review the facts, Mr. Speaker. UNICEF came out with a report just this month where they showed that child poverty in Canada has decreased by 22 percent compared to where they left Canadians under our government. 2.3 million more Canadians have been lifted out of poverty under our government. They know how to cut, cut, cut. They don't know how to support Canadians. The Honourable Member from Dufferin Caledon. Farmers are protesting. First Nations are taking this Liberal government to court, and families are literally choosing should we eat or should we heat our homes. This is Canada after eight years of this NDP Liberal government, and now Canadians get to pay $700 more for food. Merry Christmas brought to you by this Liberal government. Canadians would have preferred a lump of coal. Will the Prime Minister finally listen to Canadians and take the carbon tax off for farmers, families, and First Nations. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, Canada today has 1.1 million jobs than before COVID. The job 
dog's recovery has been six months faster than after the 2008 recession when the Conservatives were in office. Canada's GDP is more than 104% higher than it was before COVID. The GDP recovery was four months faster than after the 2008 recession, which was much more mild. The Conservatives don't know how to support the most vulnerable among us, and they don't know how to have an economic plan for jobs. Okay. We do. The Honourable Member from dufferin Caledon. Mr. Speaker, the Finance Minister wants to talk numbers. That's great. Let's talk about the two million Canadians that visited a food bank in one single month as a result of this NDP Liberal government. 800,000 Ontarians went to the food bank. It would be the third largest city in Ontario dependent on a food bank for food. This Finance Minister says she won't take lessons. Even a third grader could figure out they have destroyed Canadians and driving them to food banks. And they could fix it if they cared, Mr. Speaker. All they have to do, take the carbon tax off for families, First Nations and farmers. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance for Canada. Mr. Speaker, for once we heard something true from the Conservatives. Yes, the Finance Minister does believe in talking about numbers. So let's talk about some numbers. One million more jobs in Canada than before COVID. Eight out of ten Canadians have more money in their pockets thanks to the carbon price. And you know what? Last week I was in Edmonton. One of the largest investments in Canadian history, more than $11 billion from Dow. You know why? Because of our price on pollution. That's what the Dow CEO told us. It was underpinning his investment. The Honourable Member from L'Honorabilité de Portneuf-Jacques-Cartier. The Honourable Member for Portneuf-Jacques-Cartier. Well, with Christmas around the corner, it seems that it would have been common sense to give a little help to Canadian families. Our motion today calls on the government to leave more money in the pockets of Canadian workers. With the help of the Bloc Québécois, the Liberals want to drastically tax even more with their carbon tax. Will the Prime Minister cancel his plan to increase the carbon tax on the backs of our farmers and our Canadian families? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'd expect more from the 20 from the 2023 Conservatives, but no, because in 2023 they have opposed workers' rights, they have opposed m m measures for housing, they're against climate change, they're reopening the abortion debate with C311, and they're even betraying Ukraine, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, he is turning his back on future generations by not fighting climate change. It's shameful, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Pont Jacques Cartier. Well, I encourage the minister to step off of the Magdalen Islands and walk the streets of Montreal. Today is the Grand Guignolé des Médias food drive in Quebec. People who are on the streets asking for help because food banks are overflowing. Will this government finally understand? Alors, order, order, please. Alors, order, please. De the honourable member for Portneuf Jacques Cartier from the beginning, please. Mr. Speaker, I was suggesting that the minister leave Mag the Magdalen Islands and walk the streets of Montreal because today is the Grand Guignolé des Médias food drive in Quebec. People are on the streets asking for help because food banks are overflowing. Will this government finally understand people's desperation and listen to reason? A family of four will pay $700 more next year for groceries. So instead of wanting to tax even more with the help of the Bloc Québécois, can the government have a little heart and cancel the carbon tax, which isn't working, and that will finally help our farmers and families? The Honourable Fisheries and Oceans and Coast Guard Minister. Mr. Speaker, it's absolutely shameful to talk that way about people of the Magdalen Islands. That is absolutely shameful, Mr. Speaker. He should be ashamed to speak ill of those people from my region, Madam Speaker. Shame, he should be ashamed. Order. 
reporter. The Honorable Member for Lac Saint Jean. The member for Port Neuf Jacques Cartier should take some vacation on the Magdalen Islands soon. Now, Mr. Speaker, there are human trafficking networks at Canada's borders, criminal networks run by Mexican cartels. These are bandits who exploit vulnerable people to smuggle them across borders, which have, by the way, become veritable sieves. Just imagine, we heard from Radio Canada that the RCMP will be cutting its border staff. So on the one hand, the Minister of Public Safety is promising to increase the number of officers. On the other hand, the RCMP is potentially going to cut up to 25 percent of its staff. So imagine. You can't imagine a more ham-fisted decision. The Honourable Minister. Monsieur le Président, nous... Mr. Speaker, we share the concerns of all Canadians when it comes to the integrity of our borders. My colleague says that we will reduce RCMP staff in Division C in Quebec. That's not true. We are fighting crime and securing our borders. Since the Roxham Road crossing was closed and since a third party agreement, the RCMP reassigned its resources to prioritize fighting organized crime and to ensure the integrity of our borders. The Honourable Member for Repentigny. We have been waiting for two years for the Liberals' plan to cap emissions from the fossil fuel sector, but the wait is not over yet. The government has just announced a regulatory framework without regulations. It's guaranteed also that it won't be adopted before 2025. Worse still, the emissions cap will not come into force until 2030. And not only does this plan not require any reduction in oil production, the plan explicitly offers flexibility to oil companies to increase their production. It's literally a license to pollute until it's too late. Who wrote this plan? The oil companies? <laughs> The Honourable Natural Resources Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Bloc often talks to us about respecting federal jurisdiction, provincial jurisdiction in the fight against climate change, and today we have done both. The Environment Minister, Benoit Charette, in Quebec, said today, I commend the announcement to set up a cap-and-trade system for the oil um, sector today. He, he said, this is a good day for the environment and the economy. The Honourable Member for Repentigny. According to the International Energy Agency, emissions from the fossil fuel sector need to be cut by 60 percent by 2030 if we are to meet the targets of the Paris Agreement. Today's Liberals are content to call for a 16 percent reduction over 2005 levels, which is barely a 25 percent reduction. And that's at the goodwill, of course, of the oil companies, because no cap will be imposed on them before 2030. The federal government's plan is to beg the oil companies to make barely one quarter of the necessary efforts. Otherwise, otherwise what? Otherwise. Nothing at all. No consequences at all. So how can the Liberals announce this without feeling ashamed? The Honourable Natural Resources and Energy Minister. Mr. Speaker, Canada implemented a very ambitious plan. And it may in fact be the most detailed plan in the world to fight climate change. Today, we announced the first cap on oil on the oil sector. We're the first in the world to do so. We're a world leader in this. We're a world leader in fighting climate change. And we are doing so in a way that guarantees that we will have a strong, prosperous economy in the future. The Honourable Member from Hastings, Lennox Naddington. Canada's Food Report for 2024 revealed that Canadian families will have to pay roughly $700 more next year for groceries. Wow. Basic food Staples like meat, vegetables, and baking goods will all increase 5 to 7 percent. Canadians, Mr. Speaker, cannot afford this. Rents are rising faster than wages for the first time in 60 years. Mr. Speaker, will this Prime Minister, for once in his political life, listen to Canadians and axe the carbon tax for businesses, for farmers, for First Nations, and for families for good? The Honourable Minister for Families, Employment and Social Development. Mr. Speaker, when the member opposite talks about basics, I'd like to point out the basic fact that just yesterday, 
every member in this House, including every Conservative member, had the opportunity to support Canadian families and children by voting to support a national child, uh, national school food program. And what did they do, Mr. Speaker? Every single one of them voted against it, Mr. Speaker. On this side of the House, we will continue to support Canadian families. The Honourable Member from Hastings, Lennox Naddington. Mr. Speaker, it's no wonder food bank usage and the need for food programs are exploding because this Prime Minister's taxes are directly making food prices more expensive. Right. The rising cost of everything is not sustainable for Canadians. After eight long years of this Prime Minister and its NDP enablers, families are forced to choose between paying rent and putting food on the table. Mr. Speaker, when will this tired, liberal NDP government share some Christmas joy, axe the tax, and deliver some relief for Canadians? Yeah. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister Thank of Environment. Much, Mr. Speaker, on this side of the House, we have solutions, not slogans. Solutions for fighting climate change and solutions for affordability, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question since it gives me the opportunity on this side of the House to announce it on the same week as our government committed to a 75 percent reduction in methane emissions from oil and gas. As of today, we are the first oil and gas producing yes. nation to put a cap on oil and gas emissions, yes. Mr. Speaker. On this side of the House, we have solutions. Solutions for climate change. Solutions for affordability. When will the Conservatives admit that the only facts that they've got are those of wealthy oil executives? The Honourable Member, the Honourable Member from Dolphin Swan River. After eight years, Canadians can't afford to eat because of this Prime Minister's carbon tax. A new report shows that a family of four pays $700 more next year on groceries. The Prime Minister had a chance to lower grocery bills by removing the carbon tax on farmers. But once again, he proved he is not worth the cost. The Prime Minister spent the weekend working to gut Bill C-234 to keep the carbon tax on. Will the Prime Minister finally listen to Canadians and take the carbon tax off of farmers, First Nations and families? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, a UNICEF report released this month shows the truth, that child poverty in Canada is down 22% under our government. But you know who is driving up prices? Vladimir Putin. He's driving up the price of fuel and of food. And you know what? The member opposite has the privilege of representing a rural Manitoba constituency. It was Ukrainian Canadians who settled Canada's prairies, and we owe it to the people of Ukraine to support them today and not betray Ukraine as the Conservatives have done. The Honourable Member from Victoria. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals are patting themselves on the back for their botched emissions cap. After two years of delays, they've announced a watered-down oil and gas cap that won't even cut emissions enough to meet the Liberals' own target, only the Conservatives' old target. The same Conservatives who don't even believe this is a crisis. The Liberals are throwing young people's futures under the bus to make life easier for oil and gas companies. Will the minister get serious and fix the emissions cap? Yes. The Honourable Minister for Natural Resources and Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today was an important day. Canada became the first oil and gas producer in the world to put a cap on oil and gas emissions on a trajectory to reduce from net zero by 2050. It is important in, in our fight against climate change. Is it important? It is important in ensuring the long-term competitiveness of the oil and gas sector as we, we decarbonize and ensure that the products that we are producing are ultra-low carbon. I would say Pembina today said Canada is showing leadership by getting the economy ready for a net zero future. Clean energy Energy Canada said Canada should be commended for putting in place the world's first national oil and gas emissions cap by a major fossil fuel producing country. This the Honourable Member from Timmins, James Bay. The people
people of Attawapiskat continue to suffer a brutal housing crisis. Now there's serious questions about their water supply, and with winter hitting hard, a serious crisis is looming. We remember the winter of 2011 when Attawapiskat asked the Conservatives for help, and the Conservatives falsely blamed them for ripping off taxpayers and then expelled a democratically elected council. Shame. But under the Liberals, there's just been vague promises and no action. As this winter hits, will the government send a team to assess the situation on the ground and help find a solution for the people of Attawapiskat. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the member opposite for his unwavering advocacy for the people of Attawapiskat. I've met extensively with Chief and Council and many, many members of Attawapiskat. Indeed, the Department is working closely with the community to make sure they have the tools they need, not just in the short term as winter bears down, but in the long term so the community can move forward with their identified priorities. The Honourable Member from Etobicoke Centre. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of International Trade on the Canada-Ukraine Free Trade Agreement. I've been speaking with Ukrainian Canadian Congress branches across Canada, and they've been telling me how important this agreement is, both to Canada's economy, to Ukraine's economy, and to Ukraine's rebuild. Now, it's been over a week since the Ukrainian Canadian Congress vote to the, wrote to the leader of the Conservative Party to express their disappointment in the fact that every single Conservative MP voted against the agreement and to urge them to support it. Still, Conservatives oppose it. Could the Minister reassure Canadians that despite Conservative opposition and obstruction, this government will stand with the Ukrainian people until they win? The Honourable Minister for International Trade. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Ukrainians have a word for the Conservative position on the Canada-Ukraine Free Trade Agreement. Nitsa Nitsa. Nonsense. It's nonsense to call this agreement woke. It's nonsense to not stand up for Ukraine sovereignty. It is nonsense to suggest that this agreement puts a price on pollution on That's Ukraine ridiculous. because they've had a price on pollution since 2011. Absolutely. President Zelensky wants this agreement. The rest of this House voted for this agreement. Why won't the Conservatives vote Shame. for this agreement? Shame. The Honourable Member from Pitt Meadows, Maple Ridge. Mr. Speaker, after eight years of this Prime Minister, British Columbians are having a tough time making ends meet. Mortgages and rents are among the highest in the world. Gas prices, they're the highest in North America. Inflation on groceries have led to the longest lineups ever at food banks. As a former BC MLA, I've seen the light and hope that this NDP Liberal government will also show some common sense and axe the tax. Will the Prime Minister listen to Canadians and take the carbon tax off of farmers, First Nations and families? The Honourable Minister for Natural Resources and Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I find the question coming from the Honourable Member very interesting, given that he was a member of the caucus of the B.C. Liberal government that put in place the carbon price in British Columbia. incent innovation and drive an economy going forward and he voted for that the honorable member order order the honorable member from prince george peace river northern rockies Sadly, empty words from these Liberals won't fill empty stomachs in Nunavut. Kyra Killebuck, an Inuit woman, shares photos of current food prices in Nunavut on her social media. A can of Campbell's potato soup is $11. Wow. A, a medium box of Cheerios is $17. A small package of ham is $18. Wow. After eight years, of Nunavut knows that this Prime Minister is not worth the cost. Right. When will this Prime Minister scrap the carbon tax, finally listen to Canadians and scrap the carbon tax on farmers, First Nations and families? The Honourable Minister for Nuts. 
The Honourable Minister for Natural Resources and Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As my Honourable colleague knows, 8 out of 10 Canadian families actually get more money back. If he would take the time to actually read the study that was published by the University of Calgary recently, the people who are most vulnerable get far more money back than they actually pay. Instead of presenting a plan for the economy or for the environment, the Leader of the Opposition spends his time about musing about pulling us out of the Paris Agreement, joining Nicaragua and Syria. This will do nothing to address the economic future of Canada, nothing for the future of our children in fighting climate change. This climate-denying Conservative Party is not worth the risk. Hey! The Honourable Member from King Vaughan. Mr. Speaker, Christmas is coming and Canadians are struggling to put food on the table. Since 2016, there's been an 82% increase in the number of workers in Ontario who are using food banks. Bill C-234 would have taken carbon tax off farmers, but this desperate Prime Minister has spent the weekend calling senators, pleading them to kill the bill. He's just not worth the cost. Will this Prime Minister listen to Canadians and take the carbon tax off farmers, First Nations and families? The Honourable Minister of Labour. And I thank the honourable member for the question. There have been accusations that she has made and other members have made in the past couple of days that indeed uh, people in the other place were given marching orders by the Prime Minister on how to vote on that particular piece of legislation. Of course, that's not true. I think the real question is here, Mr. Speaker, and that so many Canadians are wondering, is on the issue of a Ukraine free trade agreement, who told them how to vote? That's what Canadians are wondering. Who told them? Or did they each arrive at this independently? What a shameful exercise to vote against a beacon of democracy in this world, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member, order. The Honourable Member from North Okanagan, Sushwa. Mr. Speaker, according to the Canada Food Price Re Report just released by Dell Housing, food will cost a family of four an additional $700 next year, totaling $16,297. After eight years of this NDP Liberal government, Canadians are being forced into the highest level of food bank use in history. Pro proving this Prime Minister is not worth the cost as he plans to quadruple his penalizing carbon tax. Will the Prime Minister listen to Canadians and finally take the carbon tax off of farmers, First Nations and families who are trying to heat their homes? Right. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for the Environment and Climate Change. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It's clear that the member opposite doesn't believe in climate change, but I'm wondering if he believes in math, because a, a, a Calgary-based economist uh, did a study on our carbon pricing program, and I'll do, give him two quotes. One, a clear majority of Canadian households do receive rebates that are larger than the pollution price costs. And second, Mr. Speaker, if we got rid of the carbon tax and rebate, this would harm lower and middle-income households. Mr. Speaker, when will the Conservatives admit that their risky and irresponsible, reckless approach will plunge Canadians back into Harper error poverty. The Honourable Member for Drummond. I'm going to ask all members to keep it down. I'm going to ask the member from from Kamloops Thompson Caribou to please uh, wait his turn to ask a question. The Honourable Member for Drummond. The announcement by the CEO of the CBC, Catherine Tate, that 600 employees will be laid off is a disaster. It's a disaster for the news, especially regional news, for Quebecers culture, for democracy, and of course for the people who work there. And Catherine Tate's water torture technique with waves of layoffs spread out over months with everyone's head on the chopping block is quite simply disgusting. And the managers have the nerve to want to give themselves Christmas bonuses. It's disgraceful. Does the Minister of Heritage still have confidence in Catherine Tate? The Honourable Minister of Heritage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank my colleague from the block for his question. Clearly, the public broadcaster gets support from taxpayers, and it's accountable to Canadians, and I would invite 
the management of CBC to answer the questions people have these days about what's going to happen to the news. We've always been there to support a strong public broadcaster from coast to coast to coast, and we're watching what's happening in Quebec and in all French-speaking communities, and we will always stand up for the CBC. The Honourable Member for Drummond. Well, I'm sure the minister would also like some answers from the CEO of CBC, and I'd like to remind the member, the minister, that it's her role to appoint the CEO. And Ms. Tate's mandate was supposed to be all about fighting fake news, but she's doing the opposite. Cutting 600 jobs is fighting news. We need to send a clear message. 600 layoffs shouldn't have been announced. None should have been announced. None or maybe just one. If Catherine Tate doesn't take back down on these cuts, will the minister fire her? The Honourable Minister of Canadian Heritage. Mr. Speaker, our government has shown from the outset since we took power in 2015, we've always supported the public broadcaster. We added the millions of dollars that the Conservatives had cut, despite the fact that the bloc uh, the official opposition at the time didn't manage to block those cuts. We restored funding, and despite all the crises that the media are going through and the pandemic and so on, we will continue to support the public broadcaster. And I would invite all parties here, except the Conservatives, of course, who would like to axe the CBC, I would invite them all to support our support for the CBC. Released today, the food price report shows that a family of four is going to pay $700 more for food next year. Meanwhile, overall dollars for food spent are going down because of the cost of everything else. That means Canadians are reducing the quality or quantity right. or both of the food that they buy. This morning, Walmart and the CEO of Loblaws, Galen Weston, said that the carbon tax charged to the farmer, to the trucker, to the retailer and then food producer will get passed on to the consumer. After eight years, this NDP government is not worth the cost. When will this Prime Minister repeal the tax on the carbon tax on farmers, first families and families? The Honourable Minister for Agriculture and Agri-Food. Mr. Speaker, being a farmer and part of a government understands that there is a problem with the climate. We do have climate change. Climate affects the weather. Destructive weather destroys farms, destroys farm crops. Quite simply, Mr. Speaker, we have a program in place. Unfortunately, the Conservative Party of Canada does not have a plan to deal with the environment. With our plan, we're able to deal with the agricultural sector and clusters in provincial governments right across the country to help farmers deal with climate change and become innovative. And we will have more to do and will continue to do it. The Honourable Member from Edmonton Manning. That is a plan of no plan. Mr. Speaker, a desperate, panicking Prime Minister spent last weekend calling senators, pleading with them to kill Bill C-234 that would lower grocery prices for, for Canadians. On Tuesday, those supposedly independent senators voted to cut Bill C-234, betraying farmers and keeping food prices high. After eight years of rising prices and lower paychecks, Canadians know that this Prime Minister is not worth the cost. Will the Prime Minister listen to Canadians and take the carbon tax off farmers, First Nations and families? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It's clear that that member doesn't agree with climate action, but I wonder if his children would agree with climate action. It's something that's going to impact next generations more than it affects us. But when the Conservatives show Canadians who they're advocating for, they take notice. So, Mr. Speaker, I'd pose the question back to the Leader of the op Opposition. As a family of four, the Leader of the Conservatives would have received $976 in climate action incentive payments. Now, he lives in a taxpayer-funded mansion and gets driven around, so he doesn't buy very much gas himself. Did he cash the check? The Honourable Member from Fort Saskatchewan, Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. Last night, under the cover of darkness, the NDP Liberal government rammed through their anti-energy, unjust transition, job-killing agenda at the Natural Resources Committee. They broke every rule of parliamentary procedure. They broke the rules and denied MPs the chance to be heard as they rammed through their anti-energy right. agenda. On the agenda of the committee and for the chair of the Natural Resources Shameful. Committee, when will the committee consider this matter again, and how does the chair justify another Another gross betrayal of Canadian workers.
As members know, this question was put to the chair of the committee. The chair of the committee is, I do not, I see the vice chair standing up, the honourable member from Lakeland. Speaker, the chair in Calgary Skyview MP should be ashamed and will pay for his choice to betray his constituents. BLC 50 is the top-down global just transition that will end 170,000. I'd like to uh, invite the honourable member from Lakelands, I'm certain, um, to make sure that there was no misinterpretation of, of her answer. To start her answer again from the top, please, but I'd ask her to be careful in the language that she uses. The honourable member from Lakeland. The constituents of Calgary Skyview will hold the MP to account for his betrayal of their constituents and he'll pay at the ballot box. Bill C-50 is the top-down just transition that will end oil and gas in Canada in favour of dictator and U.S. oil. The NDP Liberals know it will kill 170,000 oil and gas jobs immediately and hurt 2.7 million Canadians working in transportation transportation, construction, agriculture, manufacturing on top of it. It will make power, power and fuel prices skyrocket. The NDP Liberals also know it will hurt Indigenous and visible minority Canadians. The worst, it's never been more clear that Canadians cannot afford the colluding, costly cover-up coalition. Order. The Honourable Member. Order, please. Order! The Honourable... The Honourable Member for Alfred Pallant. Mr. Speaker, our bail reform bill received royal assent this week. The legislation is the result of consultations and close cooperation among our government, all provinces and territories, and Canada's major police associations. Canadians need to have confidence in our justice system, and they need to know it will protect them from harm. My question is for the Minister of Justice and Attorney General. How will this bill improve Canadians' safety? The Honourable Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada. I'd like to thank the member for Alfred Pallant for his question and for his advocacy as a representative in this House, as a father and as a Canadian. Community safety is one of my top priorities. Bill C-48 has now received royal assent. This bail reform bill will keep violent repeat offenders off our streets. Liberals will continue to fight crime and its root causes to keep our communities safe. All provincial and territorial part premiers have called for action, and police associations as well, and the municipalities. We delivered. Thank you. Member for Mr. Speaker, the RCMP plans to cut staffing at the Quebec border. We know that Quebec cartels, however, are more active, and people could get through the cracks. More and more people are dying of drug overdoses, and gangsters are not stupid. They do reconnaissance. They know that the borders are easy to cross. And they're watching staffing levels. So could the minister instruct the RCMP to keep staffing levels up to protect Quebecers and Canadians at the border? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, I've had a lot of discussions with senior members of the RCMP about strengthening our presence on the border and protecting the integrity of our borders. This is an issue that this government takes very seriously. I've also discussed this with Secretary Mayorkas, uh, my U.S. counterpart, and I can assure the member that the number of officers at the border dealing with organized crime and border safety will not go down. From South Shore, St. Margaret's. China's economic cold war of taking over strategic Canadian industries has claimed another victim. After eight years, this NDP Liberal government has turned a blind eye. 
I'm going to ask uh, all members to please uh, only call out when they have their time to speak. The Honourable Member from South Shore, Shane Margaret, from the top, please. China's economic cold war of taking over strategic industries in Canada has claimed another victim. After eight years, this NDP Liberal government has turned a blind eye to this national security threat. First, China got the Prime Minister to fast-track their acquisition of Neolithium and three other lithium companies. Now China is trying to buy Canada's only er uh, rare earth mining company, Vital Metals. That's right. China will take all the product to China, leaving Canadian firms without a supply. Yep. Will the Prime Minister invoke the Investment Canada Act now, review this deal, and protect Canadian resources? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Innovation. Mr. Speaker, our government will always stand up for Canadian workers and Canadian industries. Our government has been clear from day one, we'll always welcome foreign investment and trade that encourages economic growth, innovation and employment opportunities in Canada. We know that economic security is national security. This bill will implement the ICA, brings forward improvements so our government can act more quickly when required. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member from Cypress Hills Grasslands. Well, after eight years of this NDP Liberal government, Canadians are out of money and the Prime Minister is out of touch. Right. At a time when secure energy security is crucial, this makes life harder for Canadians and our allies. An emissions cap will destroy hundreds of thousands of jobs, billions of exports, and make life more unaffordable for Canadians. Instead of supporting powerful paychecks for our people, the Prime Minister supports dollars for dictators. So when will the Liberals' costly coalition stop supporting dirty dictator oil and let Canada export the resources that the world so desperately Really needs. The Honourable Minister for Natural Resources and Energy. Mr. Speaker, I, I would start by noting that actually the importation of oil is half the level now that it was under Stephen Harper, so maybe he wants to check some of the facts. The cap on oil and gas production is about reducing emissions in line with what science tells us that we must, but doing so in a manner that will enhance the economic competitiveness of the sector, ensuring that we actually are decarbonizing the industry such that the barrels of oil and the natural gas that Canada will sell to the world will be the lowest carbon content of barrels of gas. I would point to successes recently of an $11.5 billion Dow facility, a net zero petrochemical facility in Alberta, and many... The Honourable Member from Vaughan Woodbridge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Canadian workers built this country, and it's Canadian workers who will meet the challenges of our time. We believe that workers don't just need a seat at the table where decisions are made, they should lead it. This is the idea behind the Sustainable Jobs Act. It's why we tabled C-58 to ban replacement workers, and it's why we launched the union-led advisory table this week. Of course, the Conservatives continue to oppose every effort to bring workers to the table because they're scared of workers. Can the Minister of Labour share how our government continues to bring workers to the table to find solutions to the challenges of our time despite Conservative instruction? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. No, no, the Honourable Minister for Labour. You know what? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, yesterday we brought together Labour leaders from all across the country at our new union-led advisory table, which will advise the government on some major macroeconomic issues that have real kitchen table consequences on a lot of workers in this country, namely the energy transition, climate change, the housing crisis. We will do that at this table in the same way that we will with C-50, an 11-page bill that the, uh, the opposition has found 20,000 reasons to oppose to prevent workers from having a say at the table. 20,000 reasons. What are they so afraid of? Why are they so afraid of workers, Mr. Speaker? Here, here. The Honourable Member from Esquimalt Sanitz Souk. Anti 2S LGBTQI plus crimes, hate crimes in Canada are up 80%. So, what my community needs right now is action to help people keep people safe, especially the most marginalized. Thousands of Canadians have already called on the government to implement the recommendations in the white paper on the status of trans and gender diverse people. But trans and gender diverse organizations need resources now. Will the Minister of Women and Gender Equality commit to stable funding for trans and gender diverse led organizations to make sure that they can push back against hate and violence? Here, here. The Honourable Minister for Women and Gender Equality. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for his work, uh, for the white paper, for all he does for the community. Uh, and the answer is yes, Mr. Speaker, we will always support trans communities, we will always support queer communities across this country. 
This is why we have a $100 million plan, a TUAS LGBTQI action plan, that puts money in the hands of those on the front lines who are helping those communities. We will always be on the side of those communities on this side of the House. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Kitchener Centre. Mr. Speaker, in the two years since the PM promised an oil and gas cap, today we learned what Big Oil's 2,000 meetings with this government got them. It got them a so-called cap that's going to allow oil and gas, oil and gas production to go up. It's going to allow carve-outs for Big Oil to buy their way into compliance using the excess profits they've gouged from Canadians. And it's going to allow for a weaker oil and gas target than even the insufficient one that this government had previously set for them. When will this government put our children's future ahead of Big Oil's greed? Here, here. The Honourable Minister for Natural Resources and Energy. Today was an important day for the environment and the economy. Canada became the first country to put a cap on oil and gas emissions with a trajectory to reduce net zero by 20, uh, 2050. But I would also say we released the Emissions Reduction Progress Report today. What that showed is we are well beyond the initial target we had when we were elected, which is 30% reduction. We will achieve the 2026, more than achieve the 2026 interim milestone, and we are on track to achieve our 40% reduction by 2030. Although this brings to the end of question period, I'd like to wish to draw the attention of members to the presence in the gallery of the Honourable Jeremy Harper, Speaker of the Yukon Legislative Assembly.